Welcome everyone. I'm Susan Yaki, the director of the La Follette School of Public Affairs. I'm delighted to be moderating our event tonight, which is this year's Offner Lecture, our school's lecture series honoring the policy legacy of former Wisconsin State Senator Paul Offner. Tonight's speaker has been co-sponsored by our friends in UW-Madison's Department of Computer Science. Before moving forward, I want to quickly introduce you all to the Follett School. Many of you already know the La Follette School. It's the home of public policy research and teaching on UW-Madison's campus. The La Follette School is one of the best policy schools in the world. We educate students in two professional master's programs, as well as an undergraduate program in our brand new certificate in public policy program. At present, the school is experiencing a lot of growth, doubling the size of our faculty and over doubling the number of students that we serve all within the last year or so. Part of this growth has been funded by a $10 million investment in the school by former Senator Herb Cole, and we are so appreciative of that wonderful gift. I wanted to let folks know that there's a link for closed captioning for tonight's event in the YouTube description below. And we're also gonna be hosting a Q&A later in the hour. Please submit your questions to go.wisc.edu slash Harbaugh. Now I have the pleasure of introducing my wonderful La Follette School student and colleague, Amber Joshua, who's going to be introducing our speaker tonight. Joshua is a Wisconsin native born in Madison, excuse me, Milwaukee, with a strong passion for serving people to, in the face of socioeconomic disparities through public service and advocacy. She is pursuing a dual degree master's programs in both the La Follette School of Public Affairs and in urban and region planning at UW-Madison. Amber completed double bachelor degrees from UW-Milwaukee in economics and international economics and development. She enjoys volunteering in her community and during her free time creates nature-based artwork. Take it away, Amber. Today, I have the wonderful pleasure of introducing Katie Harbath. Katie Harbath is a global leader whose work is at the important intersection of elections, democracy, civic, and the tech industry. Katie is a proud Wisconsinite and an alumni of UW-Madison, where she received her bachelor's degree in journalism and political science. She was named one of the top 50 people to watch for in politics by Politico and a rising star by Campaigns and Elections magazine. She served as the public policy director at Facebook, where over the course of 10 years, she was credited with building out and leading a 30 person global team, recognizing for managing elections. She also played a significant role in working to get the governments and elected officials around the world at the local, regional and national levels to use Facebook and Instagram as a way to connect and engage with constituents. This work included managing the global election strategy across the company by working closely with product teams to develop deployed civic engagement and election integrity of products, including political ads, transparency features. Katie was involved in this work in major elections for every country around the globe, including the United States, India, Brazil, United Kingdom, European Union, Canada, Philippines, and Mexico. Prior to Facebook, Katie was Help was the senior strategic digital roles at the Republic National Committee, the National Republican Senatorial Committee, DCI Group, and multiple campaigns. Katie is on the boards of National Conference on Citizenship, Democracy, and Words, and the Center of Journalism Ethics at UW Madison. Thank you, Amber, so much for that introduction. And thank you also to Susan and the La Follette School uh, for having me here tonight. I also want to thank Katie Culver, who is a professor of mine from when I was a journalism and political science student at UW from 1999 to 2003. Back then, Katie saw something in me that I didn't quite see in myself that has led me to where I am today in my career and, in fact, even doing this lecture. I'm also really excited to be here today as this is the first public speech I've been able to give since leaving Facebook after 10 years. The opportunity, problems, and everything in between at the intersection of democracy and technology have never been more at the forefront of our society. I've learned a lot in the 22 years since I first stepped foot on the UW campus in 99. I've seen the positive effects of technology on our society and the negative ones. I've created new ways of helping people use the internet to be civically involved, make mis made mistakes, 
I contributed to the solutions and I've played a role in creating some of the problems. I truly believe that we can find a way forward where we can mitigate the negative effects of technology and amplify the good. That's where I wanna focus my work post Facebook and what I wanna talk about tonight. First, a little history and context of where we got, where we are today. When I talk to students these days, they're somewhat surprised when I tell them that Facebook didn't exist when I graduated college in 2003. My first job in DC consisted of me answering the phones, but also learning how to send out a mass email and code a website. My space was all the rage. People were creating blogs on Blogspot, including myself, and the iPod had just come out. YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, WhatsApp, TikTok, Clubhouse, none of these existed either. The internet first came to politics in the US with the first White House website in 1994. Google was founded four years later in 1998. And in 2000, Senator John McCain was doing the novel thing of mentioning his website URL in all of his speeches and raising small dollars online during the Republican primary. This is also the first presidential campaign that saw campaigns start to build email lists. The 2002 US midterm saw the Republican National Committee start to beta test some new ways of micro-targeting television, radio, and direct mail ads based on consumer data being matched with voter files. For those of you who aren't that familiar with micro-targeting, it's a tactic used by both parties to send tailored messages to a subgroup of the electorate on the basis of unique information about that subgroup. So for instance, based on the type of car you drove or the TV shows you'd like to watch, campaigns can combine that with information in the voter files to determine that people who watch the show CSI are more likely to be Republican and then choose to either advertise or not during those shows, uh, depending on which voters they're trying to reach. Those efforts were refined for 2004 which, wed, which led to that election as being known as notable for its creation of modern day micro-targeting, capitalizing on innovations in messaging technology. The 2004 presidential election, which was the first that I worked on, is also well known for the one where bloggers who are not professional journalists had a big impact on the national conversation, um, culminating in the scandal involving Dan Rather and President Bush's military records. At the RNC, we were experimenting with funny online videos and websites, including having interns dressed as dolphins following the Kerry campaign around to highlight his tendency to flip-flop on issues. We didn't have YouTube at the time, so it would take the team overnight to FTP uh, send me these video files. Um, and then I had to edit them and create six different versions, high bandwidth, low bandwidth, Windows Media, QuickTime, and RealPlayer. We had to pay $30,000 a month to have our own streaming server so that people could watch those videos. This was also the election where Howard Dean's campaign revolutionized the use of tools like Meetup and took online fundraising to a whole new level. Joe Trippi's The Revolution Will Not Be Televised is one of the first books talking about the impact of the internet on politics and campaigning. The election in 2004 is an important one to study as part of the very beginning of our journey to where we are today. Many of the issues and questions we face around micro-targeting and political advertising, the state of journalism, fact-checking, amplifying content, polarization, and turning up the heat on the use of outrage and anger to elicit action, all were at play. Back then, the big concern online were emails that people would forward with incorrect information about the candidates and no easy way to refute it, or what bloggers were saying to their readers. After 2004, things just became an absolute whirlwind of change and innovation of how technology would change political campaigning and governing around the world. Facebook was started in early 2004 by Mark, but started to open up to, col to more colleges um, in 2005 and to everyone in 2006. Also in 2005, YouTube came on the scene and by 2006, candidates such as George Allen of Virginia were seeing their political careers ended because they were not only caught on video saying things that they shouldn't, but that video was easy to upload and distribute to the public. Then came Twitter in 2006, where anyone could share real-time thoughts in a short and easily digestible format. And by 2008, presidential campaigns uh, 
by the 2000 presidential campaign, iPhones were also on the scene. Um, and President, the campaign of President Obama was about to take the use of technology and data to a whole new level again. They had access to platforms such as Facebook and Twitter that the campaigns in 2004 and 2006 didn't have. They had the courage to use them and to try new things. It's a big reason that they're credited for winning. Four short years later in politics, but long years in technology, brought even more tools and platforms for campaigns to use in 2012. Online advertising was finally starting to take off and campaigns were ecstatic at being able to run ads to more precise locations than what television advertising allowed. It meant they could run ads to people in New Hampshire without also having to waste money on people in Boston. This is also the time that the big shift to mobile use was happening given the iPhone was starting to increase in popularity. Now people didn't just have to be in front of a computer to consume content, but they were doing so while commuting, waiting at the doctor's office, or in line at the grocery store. They utilized the social graphs of platforms to ask people not to phone bank strangers, but rather their friends or people that they had things in common with, such as the same sports teams. The social networking effect was also being used to help increase support for gay marriage across the country. It was also starting to be used to gather more information on people to append to the voter files, including by a company called Cambridge Analytica, created in 2013. Innumerable articles and books have been written about the phenomena that was the 2012 campaign and how the use of digital tools was revolutionizing politics. Overseas, the Arab Spring had happened in 2011, and many, including myself, was feeling pretty darn good about the promises of technology. In fact, at Facebook, we were determined to make 2016 be known as the Facebook election. It ended up being that way, but not in the way that we wanted. And that's because concerns were starting to emerge. As candidates and parties in other countries started to see what was happening in the States, political consultants from the US would go to Canada, the UK, Australia, and many other places around the world to teach them on how to build and use voter files. Europe, which is well known to be much more concerned about data privacy, started to have its data protection authorities, or otherwise known as DPAs, expressing concern over data that, over the use of data this way in campaigns. That didn't stop can candidates across the world adopting these tactics to win elections, including Narendra Modi in India, Mauricio Macri in Argentina, Justin Trudeau in Canada, and David Cameron in the United Kingdom. In the United States, we were starting to see more accusations by people on the right that these technology companies were skewed more towards helping Democrats than Republicans. Facebook was facing questions about its I'm a voter button that we showed at the top of newsfeed to ask people to share that they had voted. In 2012, we had run a study in Nature magazine that showed that more people went to vote if they saw that their friends had voted. But people on both sides of the aisle question how they could trust us that we were truly running it to everyone and not only a subset of people. By the middle of 2015, the 2016 presidential race was well underway. Meerkat, a live streaming platform introduced at the popular Austin South by Southwest conference, was all the rage, and it was declared by some that 2016 would be the Meerkat election. That didn't exactly come true as Twitter and Facebook created their own live streaming platforms that quickly consumed Meerkat, but it was true that it would be the first election that really utilized live video. There was the first ever debate hosted by between Facebook and Fox in August 2015, where Donald Trump would become the first candidate to try our Facebook Live, streaming himself getting off the helicopter in Cleveland. In December of 2015, you had one of the first major decisions platforms had to make about the content of a candidate's post when Trump said that Muslims should be banned uh, from the United States. Calling for a complete ban of a group of people based on the re their religion was against Facebook's community standards. But we also didn't feel comfortable not letting people see the things presidential candidates wanted to say, a tension that continues today. Overseas, you had the campaign in the Philippines in full swing, where news sites like Rappler, run by Maria Ressa, were able to grow thanks to their use of social media. But you also had candidates like Rudy, Rodrigo Duterte using social media to harass, intimidate, and spread false rumors about people like Maria. It all started to really come into focus for myself on May 9th, 2016. 
On May 9th, I was in Manila for election night in the Philippines. I was about to do a TV hit talking about the amount of conversation we'd seen on Facebook about the candidates when I was taking a quick look at my Facebook feed and saw a story from Gizmodo where contractors were accusing the company of suppressing conservative content. I turned to my comms colleague who I was with, handed her my phone and said, I really hope news doesn't travel too fast across the Pacific. I did my final hit. The news hadn't hit Manila yet. And then I hightailed it back to my hotel. The next week and a half were so spent with myself and others working with Facebook leadership to understand what had happened, answering questions from angry, many angry folks on the right, including senators, and pulling together a small group of Republicans to talk to Mark and Cheryl at headquarters. A month later, Brexit happened, and many were blaming it on the Leave campaign's use of micro-targeting, the messages they shared and amplified on social media. In September, The Economist published a cover story about post-truth politics. I remember thinking about how much of a problem that was going to be for the German and French elections coming up in 2017. I also remember talking to some in Facebook about it, and no one was quite sure how we could ever police what is true or not. In November, Donald Trump stunned the world by winning the presidency. In many ways, his campaign continued to innovate on how data and technology could be used in an election just like President Obama's had four years earlier. But this time, the internet was vilified for enabling the spread of fake news, foreign interference, and increasing polarization. Now companies such as Facebook were forced to figure out how to solve problems like the spread of false information on its platform, from those who do it to make money to those who do it to cause havoc or win elections, to define and combat foreign interference, as well as how to bring more transparency to political ads. These are all problems the companies are still grappling with today. Governments and regulators were not stepping in to tell us how to do it, and everyone across the political spectrum and world had different viewpoints of what the solution should be. You also saw the internet and social media continue to be used by people to organize efforts across the company. Millions attended the Women's March the day after the inauguration, and that was organized on Facebook. People connected with one another to protest various travel bans and to help immigrants get legal support. Friends and former coworkers of mine raised millions of dollars online to help families at the border. By the time the 2020 election came around, the landscape once again looked very different. The year 2019 saw a huge number of elections in India, Indonesia, Israel, Australia, the European Parliament, Thailand, and many other places. In 2018, you had the US midterms and an election in Brazil. Each struggled with issues of hate speech, false news, and transparency online. It was the first election where Facebook and other tech companies introduced their political and issue ad transparency requirements and ad archives. Domestic interference online was more problematic than foreign interference because it was much harder for platforms and governments to put rules around. In 2019, some companies like Twitter decided to ban political ads altogether. Google reduced the targeting option for those ads. Facebook said that political figures wouldn't be penalized if they were fact-checked on free expression grounds, but also had a robust political and issue ads transparency database where people could see who had paid for ads, the range of impressions those ads got, and the age, gender, and location of those who saw the ads. Innovations in how the campaigns and other political groups would use technology continue to change as well. Text messaging, which had been used by campaigns for a while, became much more mainstream. Snapchat, Instagram, and TikTok were also used by candidates to reach younger voters. Candidates were also working with online influencers asking them to share campaign content blurring the definition of what's considered an advertisement even more. Online advertising, email, and data continue to dominate too. As concerns continue to mount about if President Trump would accept the outcome of the election, coalitions of experts and civil society groups came together to do threat ideation exercises of what could happen and what the president might try to say or do. Then COVID hit and campaigning was moved almost entirely online. The racial justice protests of June brought more tough content policy calls by platform and a move to start to label content. People and organizations came together to help utilize the internet um, to help people get the right information about how to vote. It was also used to help normalize the fact that we likely wouldn't know a winner of the election on election night and that the overall process could take us to January, which we all know that it did. 
And on that night of January 6th and the days following, the platforms and other internet service providers did what many thought would never happen. They deplatformed President Trump and others involved in the riots. What a dizzying time for the world. It's no wonder that people are confused about what to believe or how to pull us out of this spiral. The good news is that there are people, organizations, and companies who continue to try a way, find a way forward. Lawrence Lessig has a great framework from his book Code that Ethan Zuckerman recently reminded me of in his new book, Mistrust, by losing faith in institutions, provides the tools to transform them. Lessig said that change usually comes through a combination of law, code, social norms, and markets. For us to figure out the path forward, it will take work in all four of these areas uh, by people and organizations across the governments, the private sector, civil society, and the media. First is Lessig's law pillar. We need to figure out what the right regulation is in this space. Government is not designed to move as fast as technology is created. By the time laws are introduced, debated, and passed, the technology they were originally regulating is likely very out of date. For instance, I remember us arguing in front of the FEC in 2012 about why Facebook ads shouldn't have disclaimers because at the time they were really small and just on the side of newsfeed. They agreed it was okay that a disclaimer could be a click away, a ruling that made no sense a few years earlier or a few years later, excuse me, when ads were moved to newsfeed and had a much bigger format. So we have to think about what are the right regulations to pass that also have the flexibility to adjust and change. Section 230 is another great example of a law in a desperate need of a refresh. In Europe, lawmakers are much further along in considering legislation in this space with efforts such as the European D Democracy Action Plan, the Digital Services Act, and the Digital Markets Act. Some countries like Canada have already passed updated laws regulating political advertising online. We also have a lot of work to do to bridge the gap in knowledge between lawmakers and how the technology of today works. Having had to try to figure out some of this stuff on our own at Facebook, it's very challenging to figure out what should be done not only in the US, but in countries around the world and how those countries should interact with one another. For instance, is it okay for a Canadian organization to run ads to people in the US asking them to support trade legislation that might affect their country as well? I love trying to figure these issues out. And I think the lessons that Facebook and other companies have learned from trying to implement some of these solutions before they become laws allows governments to actually take those lessons and pass better laws. Some example of those les lessons include how to define what a political or issue ad is, how to verify an advertiser's identity and location, and what data to make transparent that doesn't also violate people's privacy. All things I think, all things I think should be decided by regulators, not by companies. That takes us to the second pillar of code, which I'm going to expand to me more of where the private sector can take a lead on presenting solutions. There are efforts such as the one I discussed around political ads transparency. There's also the efforts around labeling, combating misinformation and foreign interference. But there are also efforts such as the oversight board that Facebook stood up in 2019 and became active in late 2020. This is an independent group of what will become 40 experts from across the globe who can hear appeals from people and organizations who've had content removed from Facebook and ask for it to be reinstated. The board can also make suggestions to Facebook about where it should change its policies. It has already announced rulings on a few cases, along with the very high profile question about whether or not President Trump should be reinstated, which is being debated right now. The corporate world and the tech in general can move a lot faster than governments or civil society can in building, implementing, scaling, and iterating on many of these solutions. We need to be encouraging more companies, not less, to work on building potential solutions, as well as working with researchers to study the effects of them. This will require finding ways to share data that is privacy safe. Some efforts, such as differential privacy, are being developed, but there's still a lot more work to be done. Moreover, companies need to be doing more to help where they can in getting people the right information they need in order to be a part of the political process, from registering to vote to knowing where their polling place is, what document documentation they need to bring, and what their rights are. I'm proud of the work Facebook and other tech companies have done in this space. And just like we brought together government, 
the private sector and civil society after 2016 to combat foreign interference. I think we need to do the same in finding ways to make the process of voting easier for people to understand. Third, we need to acknowledge that these are really hard problems that involve sometimes impossible trade-offs. Developing new social norms to help governments, civil societies, companies, and the media to make those trade-offs will be key. A friend of mine from UW, Ben Thompson, has a great column called Stratechery that is read throughout Silicon Valley and the world. He's done numerous columns about how different companies, people, and organizations will prioritize the things they are trading off when making decisions. And it's not that people don't want to do all the things that they want to prioritize, but sometimes they have to make the hard decision to pick one over the other. For instance, adding more friction in the election process, whether that be requiring more transparency and reporting for the things a campaign or organization are doing to how people can vote brings trade-offs of more transparency and secure voting versus less people participating because they don't wanna jump through all the hoops that the friction in the process brings. To help think through these trade-offs, society will need updated societal norms. And the chaos we are feeling and seeing right now is the world going through that metamorphosis. Now is the time to debate and mold where these norms are going before they harden and shape the next few decades of life. For instance, the international community needs to take a stronger role in setting new societal norms across democracies about what behavior by governments is acceptable or not, because we are now seeing regulation being weaponized by authoritarian governments to hold on to their power. Second, we need new norms about whose speech gets to be amplified, whether it's by the media or internet platforms, especially when that speech comes from candidates for office or current elected officials, even more so when those officials are spreading false information. Each of the cable networks took different approaches in covering President Trump towards the end of his presidency, and recently, the Plain Dealer made a very public announcement that it would not be covering one of the Ohio candidates for Senate due to the false things he was saying and a desire not to amplify that. I personally have been grappling between my long-held belief that people should be able to hear and know what those who want or currently represent them in government have to say um, so that they can make informed choices at the ballot box. I supported Facebook in keeping up many of Trump and others' posts because of that belief. However, I also see the harm that this is causing. And I'll be honest, I haven't quite figured out yet where I personally land on keeping President Trump permanently off of Facebook. I worry about companies being able to pick and choose which politicians people hear from. Lastly, as good global citizens, we need to mirror the behavior that we wanna see in others and teach children. We need to take more care to not demonize people who think, look, or sound different than us. We need to understand our unconscious biases, work to recognize them, and do the even harder work of incorporating diversity and inclusion efforts into every aspect of our lives. We need to learn how to listen and be able to rethink our assumptions. If you haven't read Adam Grant's new book, Think Again, I highly recommend it. He talks about how intelligence is usually seen as the ability to think and learn, but in a rapidly changing world, there might be another set of cognitive skills that might matter more, the ability to rethink and unlearn. I think that's a lot of what we as individuals and leaders need to do in order to find the best path forward. Finally, markets are about choice and how people's behavior can bring about change. Just like Elon Musk creating the Tesla helped to popularize electric cars in a way that regulations could not. Part of the conversation we need to have about moving forward is about where people have the ability to choose and what, choose what they consume versus what is recommended to them. When someone signs up to Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or many of these platforms, they first make the choices about who they will follow. However, then the companies come into play by using an algorithm to sort that content from the people you follow to show you the content they think you most want to engage with. And they also show you recommendations of other things you might want to follow. This can have real benefits to people, but we also know how it can also lead people into more dangerous areas. Consumers will need to decide which trade-offs they're willing to prioritize when it comes to convenience and giving more of their data to companies. We need to help give people the tools from early on in their life about understanding how their data is used and how they wanna govern it. We need to iterate in the guardrails that should be put into place on algorithms to decide what to show and amplify to people. 
This is going to require doing a lot more work thinking about definitions around authoritative information, defining news, as well as what civic spaces need to be built for the public good. For instance, C-SPAN was created in the late 70s as a cable industry finance nonprofit network for televising, televising sessions of the US Congress, other public affairs events, and policy discussions. One of the things I'd love to work on is thinking about what a version of this could be that is financed by tech companies and streaming services that exists online to help people have better insight, not only into the federal government, but their local governments as well. There's no finish line in this work. We'll solve some problems and new ones will always emerge as new technologies are invented. We need to start anticipating sooner how to identify and mitigate side effects. We need more research, debate, and iterating on ideas. There's no silver bullet here, but I'm optimistic we'll figure it out. That said, we do need to turbocharge our efforts to be ready for future elections. In fact, I think this year is the best opportunity to enact regulation and other new norms and rules in time for the next three years of elections. In 2022, we'll have elections in the United States, Brazil, Philippines, and Kenya, among many others. And in 2024, I think the future of the internet is on the line as the world will see for the first time ever, not only a US presidential election, but elections in India, Indonesia, Mexico, potentially the UK and the European parliament all at the same time. It's a huge geopolitical moment for the world where all the governments of those major countries could all change in a very short period of time. Companies, uh, researchers, regulators, the media, the international community and civil society all need to start working together now to start building, learning, and iterating on the tools we'll need to keep those elections free and fair. If we fail, it could set us back decades. Technology has brought so many good things to our lives. Just this last year, so many of us would have been a lot more lonely, depressed, and bored if we didn't have technology to keep us connected to family and friends and allow us to keep doing our jobs and watch way too much Netflix and order groceries and many other supplies without ever leaving our homes. I think technology still has the possibility to bring positive change and engagement to our civic lives. Do we have more work to do on mitigating the harms? Absolutely. But we can also do more to help connect people to their local governments, to restore trust in institutions, and bring transparency to the process. We can use the internet and the power of friends and influencers to get more people not only to register to vote, but actually go out and vote in more elections than just for president. Speaking of voting, we can find ways to safely expand options for people to vote while protecting for fraud. We're seeing more young people, people of color, women and many others wanting to run for office. We're seeing people use the web to shine a light on problems we of society have ignored for way too long and to organize to demand change. We need to help figure out the future of journalism, especially local journalism, to adapt to the way that people are consuming news now. We need to start teaching kids in elementary school how to not only be productive members of their communities, but how to be good digital citizens. We need to do this in the US and around the world. If it all sounds really daunting, it is. Everywhere you look, there's a ton of problems that need to be solved and a ton of different ideas on how to solve them. As Glennon Doyle said in her recent book, Untamed, sometimes you just need to take the next right step and the next and then the next. That's my philosophy as I continue to look at how I can contribute to finding solutions. I encourage you to do the same. We need to make sure that we are discussing the actual problems and acknowledging the hard trade-offs working on these issues. I also ask you to be willing to work with people you don't agree with. I often find we have more in common of where we want the world to go than not. We just disagree on how to get there. It's time for all of us to work on finding more common ground than finding ways to shut people or ideas out. Thank you for giving me the time tonight to share with you some of the history of democracy and the internet, as well as where we go from here. I barely scratched the surface on all these, but I hope you found it interesting and helpful. I'm excited to take your questions. Katie, that was terrific. What a whirlwind of politics, policy, and technology. Um, I know I learned a lot. Um, we are going to take some questions now. We've already received a bunch of questions from the audience. If you haven't had a chance to participate by sharing a question, you certainly can at go.wisc.edu slash Harbaugh. All right. So I'm going to get us um, kicked off with an audience question that was submitted early. So um, thank you to our audience member who asks Katie to talk a little bit more about 
privacy issues, which she raised in her talk. So here's an audience member asking, in a digitally democratized world, how can consumers exercise their influence over companies to ensure that online platforms are free of bias? Um, and this person is particularly interested in wanting to know how do we you know, make sure and police companies so that bias isn't, um, uh, isn't furthered within technology? Katie? Yeah, it's a great it's a great question, and it's and I think there's a couple of different aspects uh, to it. I think one is um, you know calling up your elected officials who you know tomorrow there's going to be a hearing with the tech CEOs and stuff, and you know sharing with them the experiences that they've had on these had on these platforms. There's also um, just um, encouraging and, and demanding more of to, for transparency and things that are happening on these platforms and then in privacy in general, which is a little bit of a different take than I think than in bias, I think it's important that people just take the time to actually go on platforms like Facebook and Google and others and really understand uh, what data they do have on them and what they're willing to, sort of that trade-offs between what they're willing to, to give up for ease um, and convenience versus things that they may not be as comfortable doing. So you mentioned the tech CEOs are on Capitol Hill, I think tomorrow. Um, what should we expect from some of the conversation, some of the back and forth between the tech CEOs and our um, members of Congress? Yeah, I think you're going to see a lot of um, obviously discussion about what happened, um, not only on January 6th, but the company's performance in the U.S. 2020 election over overall. Um, you're going to see uh, it, there's a tension between uh, Democrats and Republicans where Democrats, I think, will be pushing for the companies why they didn't take more content down or, or, or take a more aggressive stance with some content, whereas those on the right tend to be thinking that the companies have been overreaching um, in, in doing that. And so I think it's going to be an important discussion as we do try to continue to try to figure out. Um, how to balance the the different asks and and thoughts of people about how much speech should be allowed on a platform like Facebook. So actually, that um, answer leads perfectly into a question we just got in hot off the presses from Peter in our audience. So um, Peter in our audience is asking: Is um, Facebook a platform, or is it a publisher? So how would you answer Peter's question? Is it um, a platform or a publisher? Hmm? I think it's neither. <laughs> I think we need to find a new definition for what, um, for how we do want to describe what uh, social media companies are and the role that algorithms do play uh, in um, recommending content to people and all of that. Because it's not exactly the same like a traditional publisher for for a newspaper or your local local news program, but it's also not like your telco company where you're just providing the phone lines um, and the content's going across. And so that's always been the struggle. I think it, I think it's kind of wrong to try to pigeonhole it into current existing definitions. I think we need to find a new definition for for what they are and what roles we think that they should they should play. Do you think that reg that definition will come out through conversations between tech and regulators? Or do you think that that is more in that kind of private sector sphere, which you were talking about earlier? I do think it's a combination of it's a combination of of all of them. I think in terms of having those those conversations, and I think it will come um, out as uh, as lawmakers start to actually regulate these these platforms and trying to think about what role that they should play. And I think that then like how you want to define them and define where they should be taking more responsibility versus things that should be regulated from the government perspective as those start to come more into, into focus of where those are likely going to land, then I think that will help us to better understand um, how we should define and be thinking about the platforms and the role that they play. I loved your talk and that kind of ran us across time and the political spectrum and kind of then came, um, kind of brought in more um, policy. One of our audience questions in particular wants to know about that trajectory. Um, so Victor asks, is social media going forward going to help us break the power of money in politics? And so, Katie, maybe you can even take us back in time. You know, you know, 
What's that arc been like in terms of money and politics and social media's role? And how do you see it moving forward in the future? Yeah, I think the internet overall has helped to really give more people an opportunity to run and uh, win and, and enter political office than what they could beforehand. Um, it is much easier for challengers to get their message out. Uh, you saw this with um, uh, AOC in in New York, you know, in her use of social media as part of as part of her campaigns. You see it a lot, you know, I think particularly around, I think it was the 20, 2012 or even the primaries for 2016, you tend to see more candidates are able to stay in these races longer, which we can debate whether that's good or not, but they're able to stay in these races longer because they are able to raise those smaller dollar donors and don't necessarily need to have huge um, um amounts of campaign money in order to get their message out and to try to and try to win. So I think that that is um, has already been a very democratizing uh, force. But I think social media alone is not necessarily going to do that. And that is an area where regulation and campaign finance, which is always hotly debated on both Capitol Hill and the states, um, also needs to play a role in that in terms of um, how much money is spent in, in politics in the states. So we've got a bunch of questions about just like the political landscape and how it's changed. And I know your talk really focused on technology, but you're also this observer of politics and, you know, your hands have been kind of dirty and doing it across time. What are some of the other ways in which politics has changed across time since you first started working on political campaigns and um, maybe, you know, highlight a few and comment on whether it's gotten better, worse, or maybe stayed about the same? Yeah. Um I do find that it has become much harder to to compromise or to even you know work across across the aisle than I think what it was when I first moved to DC back in 03 and 04. Um, you know, people will somewhat uh, blame that on it's given that it's easier for members of Congress to go back to their homes and senators they're not spending as much time socially together um, like they they would back in the um, I guess, pre-internet <laughs> era um, of, of doing that. But that has definitely become harder and harder uh, to do um, to do and, and explain. Um, and you can tend to um, you can tend to get a lot of backlash um, and potentially, uh, you know, lose your seat um, for for doing so. And that puts some folks in some really tough positions. And I think you saw that with some of the decisions that folks like uh, Representative Liz Cheney or Senator Mitt Romney made following the January 6th, um, the January 6th attacks. Um, you know, for the better, I have really, you look at COVID, for instance, and the ability for local health officials and governments to be able to try to use uh, a places like Facebook and Twitter and Instagram to get people information. Uh, to live stream those press conferences to help them to understand right now, you know, about where to get vaccines um, and and how to and how to do that is something that would have been, I think, much harder to to do in the in the pre um, in the pre internet era. And you know, even too, like on a on a fundraising standpoint, whether it's for you know any sort of nonprofit, but then also for a wide range of social issues. And things of that nature, you know, people who never maybe would have got the attention of editors at a newspaper or local TV to get a story have that ability to shine the light on some of the things that are happening and stream those things that then forces, you know, more conversation about those topics, I think are things that are overall very beneficial to society. We actually had a audience question come in sort of on this topic in advance of the talk. And that is um, one of our audience members wants you to talk a little bit about how we have so many kind of quote unquote reporters now on social media. They're reporting actions about policymakers. They're reporting um, government, but they haven't necessarily been, necessarily been trained in the ethics of journalism and reporting. And how do those things kind of come together in terms of social media? And you're, you're a great person to answer that with your experience in kind of your majors in journalism and political science. Yeah, I think about that sort of in, in three ways. One, um, 
I think the line between what people see as reporting versus analyzing an opinion continues to be blurred. Um, and um, I think that more can be done in terms of trying to better explain that to, to folks. Again, whether that's on social media or your cable news or, or elsewhere um, for people to understand uh, the, the approach that somebody may be coming into uh, providing, um, whether they're tweeting it or they're writing an op, you know, writing a, a piece uh, in, the, in the newspaper. I think also second, I think it's gonna be, this is where I think more um, digital literacy education at all ages um, of helping people to just be more critical consumers of what they may see on social media, um, of what they may see on the, the links that they're, they're clicking or the context that they may not be, they may not be getting. Um, I think is important for people to just just take a second to, you know, check the date on a story or, you know, if something, you know, seems like it may be off, maybe, you know, you know, investigate that a bit more, or Google search for additional stories. I have definitely fallen prey to, I click on a link and think something is true and then find out later that, that it wasn't like, it's not, it happens to the, it happens to the best of us. Um, but I think more of that digital education is, is going to be important. And then, you know, something that, um, I think thirdly is also, you know, as people are going through schools like the journalism school or learning how to be reporters, uh, continuing both for those that are learning, but then those who are practicing now, um, not only for journalists, but I think also for folks in the tech industry. I, for instance, just finished a six week course at Stanford about ethics and tech. And I think more continuing education around these ethical issues and helping people and professionals to understand them and to be thinking about them is 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 much needed um, in uh, as a resource for people because everyone's doing their best, but to have some help in thinking about um, how to draw ethical boundaries around these new types of situations, I think is something that would be uh, welcomed by many people. Yeah, I know a lot of our LaFalle School students are really interested in this sort of public sector tech area. I mean, it's just it's important, right? Speaking of that area, um, we have a follow-up question on something you raised in your talk, Katie, and that is about Facebook's new oversight board. And just talking a little bit, wanting to know a little bit more about it and wanting to have a sense of, is it really going to have an impact on how the company makes um, decisions and some of its um, ethical um, uh, issues it's facing? Yeah, I mean, it, you know, Mark has promised that, you know, they will be following the rulings of the oversight board, um, um, which they, there's only been one round, one or maybe two rounds of decisions uh, thus far. So the board is very, very new um, to see, to see this. And they have made some policy recommendations, some that the company already had implemented, um, and one around COVID misinformation that the company did not change, but they wrote about why they they chose not to not to do that. And so I think the jury is still out and we need to see a series of these decisions happen um, to see how it will actually play out in the in the long run. And I think the decision that is currently pending in front of the board around whether or not to reinstate President Trump will be a very interesting one, um, particularly in terms of how um, those outside the company um, perceive that perceive that decision and what the reaction is to on it because I think there's a decent chance that they may they may say that no he should stay deplatformed but I think there's also a chance they say he should be go back up. I was going to ask you if you were going to I know you said you were agnostic or weren't weren't sure where where you would personally want um, to fall on that question but do you have a sense of how the board might rule I mean if you had to put your dollars um, to donuts <laughs> where would you put them? <laughs> I really have no inside track whatsoever um, on what they on what they may decide. I just don't think that it's any sort of slam dunk that they're going to decide that he should stay off. It's a complicated issue, and so we'd expect it to be a complicated answer. Yeah, you mentioned COVID misinformation, and so hot off the presses today is this um, new coalition of twelve attorney generals that are sending letters to both Facebook and Twitter asking and really, really pressing for um, more assurances that online conversations are not going to undermine some of the vaccine rollout on COVID-19. Um, 
any sense of um, kind of how both Facebook along with this oversight board is going to handle COVID misinformation going forward on platforms like Facebook? Yeah, it's that was actually one of the, you know, I mentioned in the oversight board, you know, they had actually recommended um, uh, the oversight board actually, um, at least in one of the pieces of content that had been taken down for COVID misinformation, the board said should actually go back up. Um, and I think it really illustrated sometimes the difficulty of like looking at just one post versus thinking about how it scale to try to detect and take down uh, content that might be vaccine misinformation. I know that it's very important to all of the companies to want to to want to get this right. Um, but the, this goes back to some of those hard trade offs that I talked about. It takes a while to train machine learning algorithms on how to be more accurate in terms of detecting content that is actual misinformation versus things that might just be discussing it and, and, and uh, debunking it potentially, or things that are in a bit more of a gray area. And so companies do have to decide, like, do they want to, are they okay with more false positives and potentially taking more content down uh, that may not actually violate, but to be on the safe side versus not. Um, but then with that trade-off, you are going to get people who are very frustrated that content of theirs got taken down and it wasn't actually uh, vaccine misinfo. And so I think it's important, you know, the companies are trying to find better ways to, to do that and detect that. But then I think that's also why it's important they're doing all these efforts to try to get more authoritative information out there. Facebook has, has its COVID information hub, you know, other tech platforms are doing more things with the CDC um, and state um, authorities to help people to know like vaccines are safe you know, working with celebrities and other trusted individuals to show, like it's really important to show those pictures of folks that they recognize and, and trust that are actually getting those vaccines as well. And so you gotta have work on both ends um, to try to combat that and to try to just increase people's comfortability of actually taking the vaccine. So we've had a couple questions come in on privacy. No surprise, right? What a, a huge issue. Um, and I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, some of the new kind of encryption and enhanced um, privacy protections that are attached to a lot of new kind of social media. And how do you see the trade off to kind of pushing some of those um, some of that content may be underground, um, which is coming maybe coming off of a, a platform like Facebook and moving into something else. What are the, how does Facebook react? Is that a welcome um, move from an, a platform like Facebook or is, you know, how is how's Facebook dealing with some of these kind of privacy and encryption issues that are facing society today? Yeah, I think this is, um, this is like one of the granddaddies of hard trade-offs. Um, when you think about, particularly when you think about this globally, um, encryption has a lot of benefits, particularly in countries who are not as free as the United States, where people are regularly surveillanced uh, by their governments. They could face jail time um, and other repercussions for the things that they are they are saying. And encryption can be really important to protect to protect their privacy and allow them to have those conversations. But then it does make it much harder because you cannot. Uh, surveil, I hate using the word surveillance, but like that's the scary word that we really need to think about in trying to monitor and try to find uh, misinformation around what, what is happening. And so um, I think that it's going to be a combination of trying to think about, um, are there ways, first of all, A, are there product changes that can happen that can help to lessen the spread of this? WhatsApp, for instance, made changes where it limited the number of messages that could, times a message could be forwarded. That did a lot in terms of reducing the spread of false information. They've been doing marketing campaigns to um, to show to try to again encourage people to be good digital citizens in terms of what they share and, and don't share uh, on these on these platforms. Uh, I do not have the silver bullet answer um, on this one. It's one area where I do want to explore a little bit more, but I think that there are different ways that we can start try to think creatively um, about, again, trying to find that balance between privacy, but also reducing reducing harms. So you mentioned you were tackling a big trade-off. I'll give you another one. We have an 
audience member who is asking about social media's role in segment seg segmenting society. So put differently, this, this audience member says, does social media contribute to social fragmentation and, and our polarization today? And how can social media perhaps be a solution to some of that fragmentation and polarization? Yeah, I think, you know, there's been a lot of discussion right around filter bubbles. Uh, you know, Eli Pariser coined that in a book, I think he wrote back in 2011 on that. Um, and there's been a lot of interesting research since then. Some of that research shows that people do actually get a diversity of thought on social media um, because it does somewhat mirror your real life. Um, and many people are friends with people across the political spectrum or family members <laughs> with people across the across the political spectrum um, on that. Um, for me, this, this is that interesting tension between where do you let people choose what they want to follow and then also what are companies recommending, recommending to them or, or picking and choosing as well as how do you think about providing additional context to people that there may be, you know, multiple ver sides to, to a story to be, to be considering. And I think that this is something too, that needs to be looked at very holistically. Um, uh, Ezra Klein has an amazing book on this called why we're polarized that actually focuses a lot more in terms of how much politics has become a part of our identity. If I remember this right, there's a lot about people self-selecting about where they live um, that has a lot to do with this. The broader media e media ecosystem is also a part of this. So I'm not trying to say that social media is not a part of the problem. It absolutely is. I need to continue to rethink that. But I think we'd be doing a disservice of thinking that if we solve the social media problem, that that will fix the broader problems without looking at the bigger ecosystem. One of our audience members, Evan in Wisconsin, asks, so what, type of, what type of regulations should we be advocating for as digitally evolving voters? So I love that phrase. Nice. <laughs> what kind of regulations should we be advocating for for digitally evolving voters? Yeah, I might steal that phrase, Evan. Um, <laughs> uh, so I think for me, transparency is one that I, I think is a lot, is an area that can be explored can be explored a lot, a lot more. Um, it definitely adds more friction to the process. And there are areas where transparency might cause harm in, in different countries and, and all of that. But I think in general, um, people being able to have more information and being able to see what is happening, I think in general is a very, is a very good thing. And I think something that could be explored um, a lot more. I think having uh, common definitions that different companies need to use right now, they're all coming up with their own definition of what is a political or, or issue ad. Um, and so having some of those things that can be uh, common across the board will be, will be quite good um, for people in trying to think about how to uh, solve some of those. Uh, I also think uh, to just um, more debate, um, and also just thoughts about where do we want the lines on some of like speech and content policies. And uh, there's there's a difference. Um, a lot of speech is legal, but and there's harmful speech that is legal. And so where is that? How you define things like harm and stuff like that, I think are areas where it will be hard for government to be involved because of, of First Amendment. But I do think that there, you know, uh, there could be ways of just trying to think through more about how do we give companies the frameworks to thinking about how to be making some of those decisions. Well, Katie, it's almost the witching hour. I have one more question for you. And this comes from our audience members as well. One of our audience members, um, they're looking at you as this super successful Badger alum, right? And saying, what, looking back, what are the best and worst um, that things that have kind of happened to you across your career? And also they want to know what's next for Katie? What's the next step Ooh, post Facebook? Mm. Um, I think one of the, the best things, um, I owe a lot to being able to go work at Facebook. They allowed me to work internationally and I had never traveled internationally before and to get that experience. And the people that I work with there, have worked with there and continue to work with there are just some of the smartest people in the world that are really, truly trying to find the answers 
uh, to these to these questions and just having them in my life um, as friends and colleagues has just been one of the best things, uh, the best things ever. Um, on on the worst um, of it, uh, gotta say that that 2016 to 2018, the last couple of years have been really really tough, uh, really really tough um, uh, around uh, grappling with everything that happened and how to think about. Um, moving forward um, and getting that from all across the globe all day, every day and trying to find the solutions has been has been pretty tough. Uh, in terms of what's next, um, I want to stay working in this space. Um, I'm currently going to um, try to put together a portfolio of projects for myself. I've got an LLC started that I'm going to call Anchor Change. Um, and so I'm going to try to do more speaking events like this, find consulting and other projects that I can work on, um, as well as hoping to try to find more opportunities to work with students who are trying to learn about these issues and are the next generation of people who are going to have to be thinking about solving these problems too. Well, we're so glad you could share some of your path today with us and really put forward some of these trade-offs and hard um, grappling questions that you are you know, that you're thinking about. And I'm personally really glad you're going to spend the next few years, days, months um, thinking about these hard questions too. So, Katie Howarth, thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate. Thank you it. so much.